All right. Uh, so that was Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Teach Your Children Well, uh, something I picked out for our show today. Uh, and I'm being joined by Dr. Sherry Carr, who is the coordinator of the philosophy program in the Humanities Department of the Division of Academic Affairs. Uh, Dr. Carr is on to discuss her work in the area of philosophy for children. And uh, welcome back, Dr. Carr, uh, who is a regular on the show. How many times have you been on the show? Um, I thought only twice, but I'm so happy to be considered a regular. Hi, Hugo. Yeah, you've been, yeah, if you've been, if you've been on the show more than once, <laughs> <laughs> you're a regular, uh, but you make a big impression. And, and, you know, one thing that I would say, too, is you've been instrumental in helping me put together uh, guests who have joined me for May It Please the Court when, when I was right. doing the, uh, the shows about uh, reproductive rights as they uh, were played out in the Supreme Court uh, cases over the years. We never got to we never got to go through all the cases. And then all of a sudden, Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. was uh, reversed. And I believe we did a show right around that time mm -hmm. as well. But just thank you for that. And by the way, I would love to go back to doing that again. So we should talk about that at some time. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. I, I imagine there's a lot of interest in talking about the Supreme Court right now, um, not just with regard to reproductive rights, but also uh, you know larger issues in the Supreme Court and our relationship to it. So we definitely have people who I'm sure are really excited to talk about that. And yeah, let's set something up. I, you know, I, uh, that's what they tell me, but you know, getting them on the show is 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 something else. That, it's always but, the challenge, uh, right? The, the the scheduling is always the challenge. <laughs> right. Uh, my reach exceeds my grasp. <laughs> so, but today, uh, we're gonna, we I want to focus on something which is, you know, uh, I know you've been involved with for quite some time, which is the subject of uh, the philosophy for children. Mm -hmm. So, uh, want to let's just hit the ground running and get started on that. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Sherry Carr, for those who don't know me. Um, I came to, first of all, I came to philosophy as somebody who was interested in, interested in reading, interested in thinking, um, interested in talking about ideas. I came to philosophy because I took a bunch of other, you know, classes in college and then realized that, oh, I get to just talk about ideas and philosophy. And if I do philosophy, it's just going to make me better at doing any of these other things that I'm interested in doing. Because, you know, I didn't want, I was young. I didn't want to close off doors for myself. So I thought, oh, I'll study philosophy. And that way, when I want to switch later on into something else, I'll be in a good position to like understand what's going on and do a great job. Um, and it turns out I just stayed in philosophy because I liked it. And one of the reasons that I liked it so much, the very first philosophy class I ever took was in the philosophy of fairy tales. And that was the one that, that hooked me into philosophy because it was this beautiful class that was about how our relationship to the mythologies that we tell to ourselves and to our children has shaped us through the centuries. Um, so after taking that class and that being the hook that brought me into philosophy, then I get to my grad school and I'm at the University of Memphis. I'm from Memphis. I'm sure you can probably tell with my accent. Um, and we had, I had a fellow graduate student there, Michael Burroughs. And Michael, if some of you might know his name, um, he's gone on to create a really incredible public philosophy ethics center um, down in Southern California. He was the executive director of the Philosophy Learning and Teaching Organization, which is the premier sort of philosophy for children organization in the country. Um, but at the time he was just a graduate student and he pulled together a bunch of graduate students like myself to start to offer philosophy after school enrichments for the on-campus children, on-campus school children. So children who were in the range of like second to fourth grade. So it was really that introduction that brought me into philosophy for children um, and that allowed me to bridge that interest that I had had that brought me into philosophy in the very first place, which was philosophy and fairy tales. Um, so that's that was a little introduction about me in relationship to the field of philosophy for children. But you might be asking yourself, what is philosophy for children? <laughs> 
Um, so I'll give you a little description of philosophy for children. Philosophy for children is an international movement of philosophers, thinkers who want to introduce philosophical thinking to pre-college kids. Very simple. It's actually um, the, or the origin of philosophy for children as a movement was actually locally. Um, there was a professor, he was at Columbia at the time, Dr. Matthew Lippman, who, um, this was the late 1960s, he started thinking about, oh, okay, so he's in this context, think of the late 60s, of incredible social upheaval, of, of big political change, a lot of political division at the time, and a sense amongst many people that there wasn't a lot of reasoned discourse happening right and so for him he was like okay so how can how can i help how can i wade into this dialogue and he thought hey i can help to create better civil discourse right um in in the society by supporting people's thinking from the time they're children all the way up to adulthood and he wanted to argue that, hey, this historical discipline, philosophy, been around for thousands of years, that we were in the best position to be able to do this kind of work. And that one of the reasons why we saw this kind of partisan polarization, where we saw the, the breakdown of reason dialogue, was because we didn't focus on this type of education when people are young. We wait until they get to college and then they get some philosophy and some classes in reasoning and critical thinking and argumentation and those kinds of things. So he wanted to, to back it up um, and started there. So originated in New York, um, up, at, up at Columbia, Matthew Littman moved out to New Jersey and then he developed his first, you know, sort of philosophy for children organization, which was based in Montclair. And from there, it's really grown across the world. So there's philosophy for children, organizations, and outreaches, some of which are attached to academic programs, some aren't. Um, all over the world, Singapore, Japan, Italy, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, um, every place you can imagine, they've got philosophy for children there. Um, and a lot of these places, have different models for philosophy for children, right? What does it actually look like to do it? But a lot of them have in common, and I can talk to you about a kind of structure for what a philosophy for children outreach session looks like. But I'll stop there for a second because I've been talking for a while. Hugo, do you want to ask me any questions about this? <laughs> I have I have a bunch, but I, I, I was waiting for the for the. Uh, yeah, better, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll give an example. I mean, this felt like a I, natural. Yeah. No, 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 it's a good, it's good. I mean, one of the things that I was going to have you define, the, you know, use this term philosophical thinking. So I wanted to define, but, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about as you say this is, you know, I, I chose, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash to open the show, Teach Your Children Well. And because, uh, you know, I'm an old, I'm an old uh, hippie or hippie wannabe. Uh, I'm on the tail end of the baby boomers. And they're, they're one of my bands. Uh, as my friend Peggy likes to say, old man, old, old man music. I love it. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, you know, that it could have been the other song I could have played is you have to be you you have to be taught. I don't know if you know that song. Mm -hmm. And so I would think that there are I mean, you know, there are parents that are that, that are questioning what's being taught at the college right. level. So I can't help but think, you know, because I, I think of the. There are very different schools of parenting, and in one of those schools, you are you are basically told to not ask questions, yeah. but to do what you're told. Right. Uh, children should be seen and not heard. So, what are your thoughts about that? Because I'm I'm guessing that this you this 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 kind of movement has has found pushback in various various realms. It's interesting um, because I think that I have two thoughts about this. So first off that is definitely 
a strain in education, especially the education of children, that when Matthew Littman was developing this model in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, that he was having to push back, push back against this kind of um, learning, rote knowledge, memorization model of education that had come to be so prevalent um, in the United States during that time. So he was definitely pushing back and he was really explicit about it. The way in which we're teaching children encourages them to develop a passive relationship to thinking where they're going to be getting the right answer from somewhere else and they don't need to develop the skills to figure out what the answer is themselves. They just have to memorize it or look to the correct authority to know what the answer is. And he wanted to say, listen, that's fine for some, for some things, but if we want to train people in the capacity to problem solve and critically think and engage at a high level in this kind of public discourse surrounding things like, should we be part of a war? What should our relationship we, be with the environment? Um, who should I vote for, right? Um, then we need to train people not just in that kind of memorization model, but in something that's much more creative and active, which would be more philosophical, um, or at least so, right, in, on that model of philosophy. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so do you, so you don't think that, that there are political consequences to this approach? Because I just keep, you know, as you talk about this and this notion of deciding who to vote for, there are factions that are trying to encourage you to vote for somebody, you know, uh, without questioning. Yeah. But, and to just, for whatever reasons, like they're, it, it's funny because the, I've heard two ways about, you know, some people think that it's a lot easier to govern uh, the educated, mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually you want an educated body, they're easier to govern, uh, but then there seems to be this encouragement, at least in the public school level, to undermine education. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, again, you, you, people are not capable of making these decisions for themselves now. Right. right. Um, so I, I, I think I wanted to actually touch on the second thing that I was going to say, which is, um, I do think that there's been a pretty broad ranging movement within education to take those criticisms to heart. Um, and so for example, in my children's school that they go to critical thinking is actively taught, right? I mean, they are taught from, I mean, their kindergarten and second grade, no, third grade <laughs> at this point. And they are being taught principles of debate, right? Principles of civil discourse, right? They're being taught how to analyze an argument and how to make an argument themselves, right? Very simple, basic level stuff. Um, but it, it is a more active model of thinking, not just that kind of rote memorization. And even in their mathematics, you know, they're getting something that's much more embedded in, well, what are the reasons behind this rather than just, I have to repeat the correct answer. Um, and so I do think that it's, it's like simultaneously a little unfair to sort of paint all of education with this um, broad brush of like, well, you're not, you know, doing students justice um, by having this kind of rote model um, when so much of education really has turned um, in a different way. And that's one of the reasons why this kind of culture war thing that you're pointing to has become so um, such a touch point for parents, right? Because they're worried like, okay, so if you're teaching critical thinking, like what are you teaching, right? And is it something that would align with my values? And it is the case. Like I'm not one of those people who thinks that that philosophical thinking is somehow like above and more objective than other types of thinking. You know, we come with a set of values, and one of the set of values, one of the pieces of value that we that we bring to this conversation is we value looking at what it is someone's trying to purport, right? What is your conclusion? And what are the reasons that you're using to support it? Do those reasons 
hold water? Do they support the conclusion that you're asking them to support? And that's one of the foundations for being able to have dialogue across differences. We have to agree on something. So let's agree that if we have a difference of conclusion, let's look at why. And we have to be able to say like, well, do these, con do these reasons that are used to held up these conclusions, um, are they good ones? That would be helpful. Uh, right. <laughs> you want to talk. You want to talk a little bit about uh, how your, you know, this interest for you in philosophy. Uh, it's, I guess it's more than interest. It's your, it's your, your field of study. Uh, you know, plays out in the work you're doing here at the college. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me talk. Let me come back to that um, description of what a philosophy for children session looks like. It looks different. Obviously, there's different all over the world, um, they're doing different types of things that are especially inflected culturally. In the United States, right here, so close to New Jersey and, and, uh, and Montclair and Matthew Lippman, the model that we tend to take is, um, is actually a pretty simple model where you have a prompt, you have a series of questions that are asked usually by the participants, and then you have a discussion of those questions that's attempting to answer them and engage in a kind of back and forth dialogue about whatever the questions are or some subset of them. So prompt, questions, dialogue. Um, and usually the prompt, not always the case, but for me, especially the prompt is a storybook. So you might choose something usually a little bit below the level of the readers that you're working with. So if I were working with second graders or first graders, I might choose The Giving Tree. Um, famous book. <laughs> You've probably read it before. Um, the Giving Tree, you would read the book out loud to them, walk them through. We're all crying at the end. And then, <laughs> hopefully not, but <laughs> you try to keep yourself from crying. I can't do The Velveteen Rabbit. Um, so you get through The Giving Tree. Then um, I talk to the students about, um, okay, so what happened in this story? Like what was going on? So that we get a sense of like, okay, so we agree on the state of affairs. And then we talk about the questions that we came up with in thinking about this story. Like what are our questions? A lot of them are gonna be empirical questions that, that, um, that students will come up with where they'll say like, well, why are the apples red and not green? Um, but they'll also come up with philosophical questions. Um, and particularly for the giving tree, they tend to go in a couple of different directions. They either are going to be focused on the kind of environmental ethics of the story. So like what is our relationship to the earth and to the trees? Or they're going to go in the kind of familial ethics relationship, which is like, OK, so how do we treat our parents? Uh, <laughs> who give so much to us, uh, what's the right way to do this? And depending on which way they go, then you're like, okay, so let's vote on our questions. Let's decide what we wanna focus on. And then you have the discussion. And the, the facilitator, like me, my job isn't to answer the questions for them. My job is to help push their questions in a philosophical direction if they need to be and also to then just facilitate the dialogue. So it's not one, one student asking a question to me that I answer. It's a student ans asking a question and then me saying, if I need to, what do you think about this? And if somebody answers and say, oh, what do you think about this answer? Um, and eventually through practice, right, they get much better at sort of self-facilitating that discussion, you know, I can bring in, right, I'm, it's meant to be something that is um, cooperative, right? So I'm part of the discussion, but I have to make sure that given that I'm in a position of power, right, I'm the, I'm the adult in the room, that I'm not overstepping into, hey, I have the answer and you just need to listen to me. That's the uh, it's that Okay, so, it, and it sounds like you're using the tools of philosophy. Yeah. You pick, uh, let's say, a content area, like you said, that is a couple of years uh, below their level to just use as a, as right. the, whatever you want to talk about, as the, uh, the armature to mm -hmm. build the whole process around. 
and you can and this is something you're talking about doing k through 12 right so um in philosophy for children it's done k through 12 um and usually programs will focus on a particular age group um usually you know who they ac have access to most philosophy for children programs focus in fourth through 12th grade right so they tend to focus on older kids now there's two unique things that we do at LaGuardia one of them is that we focus on those younger children so I am primarily working either depends on the semester but I'm either working with the children in our early childhood learning center and so we're talking three to five year olds so pre-k <laughs> age children um or if I'm working with the DOE, I'm working with first and second graders. So on the on the earlier end of where philosophy for children tends to see itself um, as starting. So that's one of the unique things that we do at LaGuardia. I can talk about the other one, but do you want to you want to ask more about? Well, you can, and <laughs> no, 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 I'm just interested because, for example. Uh, you and I work together with College Now, mm -hmm. uh, and and the probably the the cohort for humanities, the biggest course for that cohort is critical thinking, uh, which is a course I've never taught. John John Chafee, the former director of philosophy, had offered me a course, and I could never do it, and I have always regretted it. And then I, when I started looking at it, I always said to him, "I wish I had taken this course in college. <laughs> uh, it would have helped." Uh, but in that course, separate, me, totally separate issue, Hugo. You and I should talk about photography because we're we're updating that critical thinking textbook, and we need more pictures. Sure, we can always <laughs> talk about it. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, that's it's fine. And uh, but so in that course, I think that the students are. And tell me if I've, I've cat, I'm 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 uh, painting the wrong picture about it. There, they are. You are sharing uh approaches to yeah. thinking ph philosophical thinking and you do relate it back to some of the folks who were instrumental in the development of these ideas at least concretizing them and whatever whatever it is in text or his historically but uh but then you when you move on to study philosophy in the intro to philosophy uh we're learning about the history mm -hmm. of the simultaneously the the players their <laughs> thinking and how it played out mm -hmm. historically. So it's a, it's you know when you're saying philosophy for children, mm -hmm. uh, again it goes back to this idea that we're we're just we're using the tools of philosophy and the approaches to philosophy rather than teaching it as a discipline yeah. with, for example, it, the historical context of all things. So I do there, I have used, um, especially dialogues um, from Plato, things like that that are much more accessible. Um, in translation, <laughs> I have used those with older children, so like fourth, fifth, sixth graders. And high school students, you certainly can use those texts with, especially if you excerpt them, you know, making it more um, accessible, focusing on one particular problem rather than a global understanding of the dialogue. So you can do some work in the history of philosophy with philosophy for children students. I have found it to be more powerful and more accessible for these especially younger, younger, younger children to do things that are much more, that are more like picture books, right? They love picture books, but they also love to play with toys. And so right now I'm doing a uh, philosophy in puppets that I'm doing with the DOE and we have a picture book, but then we create a puppet and then we use the puppet to engage in dialogue about the philosophical questions that emerge from that particular book. So we, last week with these students, we read a book called Scribble Stones. And Scribble Stones is all about a rock that wants to express its own individuality, but it's just a rock and it's kind of just sitting there and it doesn't have any way to right, express its own individuality. And then it's on a table and it gets paint splotch. It gets a paint splotch on it. And over time, it gets more paint splotches. It gets kind of messier and messier. And as it as it gets messier, it actually is like, oh, this 
feels good. Like this feels right. Like this is an expression of, of who I am and this is creativity. And so it's, and then it goes out and it kind of meets other rocks and they're like, you are very colorful. And they're like, yeah, that's the point. And so we make little puppets that are like basically like little pet rocks with little googly eyes. We paint them, put them on sticks. So they're little sticks. I should get one of my rock puppets. I can show it to you. Um, but we make the puppets and then we talk about the themes that arose in the book. So we talk about like, well, what is creativity? Who am I? Um, one of the great conversations that we had last week, and keep in mind, these are kindergarten and first graders. We talked about um, feelings, right? And so like the feeling of being yourself, also whether rocks have feelings. Um, and one of the one of the children was very was very clever. She said, um, "Rocks don't have feelings like people have feelings, but maybe rocks have rock feelings." and trees have tree feelings and people have people feelings. <laughs> but so you see already that even this child is, I think she was one of the first graders, but she's already trying to take a complex concept and break it into different possible components to be able to talk about it in specificity, depending on right the, the, the thing it's attached to. So not just, feelings but like specific feelings for this thing feelings for this thing what do we mean by this well it's much more complex than maybe the surface would give us the impression because it's just one word let me do a quick station break yeah uh so the show is what's going on i'm your host hugo fernandez and today my guest is dr sherry carr who is the coordinator of the philosophy program in the humanities department of the division of academic affairs and dr carr is on to discuss her work in the area of philosophy uh, for children. And one of the things that ran through my mind, uh, I was kind of doing a reverse thing where, have you, heard, have you ever heard of the book, The Tao of Pooh? I have. I never read so, it. Tell me. Well, I mean, it's been, uh, you know, and I've read parts of it, but I don't have, I'm not an authority. I used to have friends who keep it in their back pocket. Nice. Oh, uh, that loved it because there, what you're doing is you're taking a children's story and you're extrapolating thinking or that can be applied as an right. adult. Yeah. Uh, in that case, uh, I also think I also think about you know we, we talked about this before because I I I had, I'd used the phrase psychology uh, accidentally and you had to correct me in saying no we're talking about philosophy today and uh, but I remember years ago in the sixth grade when I had a child psychologist show up to our course uh, our class and talk about uh, the warm fuzzies yeah I don't know if you ever heard about the warm fuzzy world mm -hmm. and I always tell this story as a as an adult because. He, the, the psychologist took us through the whole thing uh, and, of course, has created this incredible, complicated problem for the land of the warm, fuzzy people and then and said, I'll be back next week, kids. And I don't ever remember him coming back. Oh, no. <laughs> so as a child, I grew up and as a, I became an adult. And I'm saying, like, well, you know, what? how, yeah, how is that supposed to? And so happy. eventually, yeah, exactly. So in the end, as an adult, I had to, I had to finish you know, I had to come up with my own ending. Right. And so every once, but every once in a while, I tell the story to people, to children. In fact, right. my daughter hates it because I bring it up all the time. But it's like, how would you have ended? How do you end? Yeah. How would you have solved this problem? How would you have ended the story? Right. It's some, you know, some people. It's funny because some people don't get it, and then some people just, you know, they come, yeah. they come up with the same answer that I had to struggle, you know, a decade or that's more to resolve. But I think. But. That's uh, that's a great potential model for philosophy for children, where you're like, I'm going to open this story, but then you're going to finish it. And then we can talk about your various ways of finishing the story. And like, what do we like? What do we not like? What are the reasons that we chose this? What are the reasons that we chose this other thing? And let's compare those together and see if we come up with something that's maybe like collaborative. Um, I'm sorry that you, <laughs> that you, <laughs> that you had to <laughs> play on this for a long time. All those. Yeah. Well, it was, funny, you know what was good about it? It because, you know, in the end, the answer you come up with yeah. becomes your ethos. Right. right. I, don't, I don't know if it's, I'm not saying it's the right ethos. It's just, right. it's mine. Right. Sometimes that it gets me in trouble. I, I, I thought about it, like while we were talking here, just thought about it. Well, it would be, you know, when you get into, you know how when you're interviewing people for, mm -hmm. you know, like we do through these search committees, you know, telling them a fairy tale and say, okay, how would you end? 
and you would know exactly who you're dealing with. Yeah, no, you would, you would. And here's, here's another cool model for philosophy for children is like taking a classic fairy tale, like, you know, your Cinderella or your Snow White um, and telling the story and then asking like, well, what would you change if you were going to retell this? Right. So you right. Not, not just like, here's an open ending, but like, what would you change about this story that we all know um, very, right. very well? Um, yeah. yeah. John Gardner, you know, the, you know, the work of John, John Gardner was a, a, a writer and uh, he retold the story of Beowulf mm -hmm. from the perspective of the monster. Mm. And I don't know if there's anything to be gained from that for children as well. Uh, you know, to tell the story, you know, again, Cinderella, what would, what would, what would the story be yeah. from the stepsisters and, and their behavior <laughs> towards Cinderella <laughs> and the things that they're trying to do? Maybe yeah. there's more to be gained from that. Well, isn't that, isn't that the kind of move that something like Wicked makes? Oh, exactly. That's exactly what, yeah. So I guess it's all being done already. Right. In a sense. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of work to do out there. Like, what's the, what's the <laughs> mythology, and in what ways do we want to change it, and what does that say about who we are or who we want to be? Right. Um, those are, so, I mean, those are the really urgent questions. Um, so, what what kind of success have you had with this work here at the college? So, um, there definitely have been people over the years who have tried to do an assessment of like how does if it does at all, right? How does doing philosophy for children support students, um, children in their growth, um, you know, academically? I do not do that kind of research um, primarily because I don't feel comfortable not coming from a background in social science, you know, developing that those kinds of research projects. But what I do is, and this is what the other thing that's super unique about the philosophy for children work that we do at LaGuardia is that we have interns, right? So I have an internship that has students work with me, shadow me in the philosophy for children classroom, develop their own lesson plans, read, write, like we discuss, and they get a you know, trial by fire right in the philosophy for children world. And so the research that I've attempted to do that was sort of beyond the philosophical research of like, okay, so what can this tell us? Um, how do we relate to these concepts and how do we want to change them? Um, is asking not how is this improving the academic performance of the children, but how is this affecting the academic performance, learning, and growth of our students at LaGuardia, so the ones who intern for me. Um, and that's a, that's very unique, right? That it's typically the case that in philosophy for children, you don't start to get to do philosophy for children in the field until you're a grad student. And so that was my introduction to it, right? Was as a grad student, I already had a lot of background in philosophy and many classes behind me before I ever walked into the classroom with the children. I'm a little bit radical here within the philosophy for children world. I, mean, I do genuinely think that everybody is a philosopher. Um, you know, some of us have like thematized that more or, less, more or less in our lives, but everybody's a philosopher and you don't need a deep background in the history of philosophy in the Western context in order to engage in the type of deep, rich philosophical thinking that is what really matters. And so what I try to do with my interns is to say, listen, you know, you, you've taken a philosophy class because otherwise you wouldn't be in my office. <laughs> so let's try to build on that so that you can engage in these kinds of dialogues with children who also ha don't have a lot of background in philosophy, but can still engage in these philosophical conversations. And some of my best interns have actually come from the art field um, because they're coming with a lot of creativity, a lot of um, willingness to play. And I'm not an artist, but I've had the, uh, the students from art who've come to be my interns who have developed different um, puppets for me and different um, coloring projects and different painting projects for the children, which have been wonderful. And yeah, just listening to you, I, I think about 
I told you I can't. Obviously, I'm not a I'm not a philosopher. In fact, I never took a philosophy course when I was an undergrad, which I guess I'm sad about. Though I do, I have been watching uh, Dr. Brown's videos that he's still got up on YouTube. Consciousness which, you know, Live. He's he's, yeah, he's are, in season six. No, I'm talking. No, I'm talking about like you know his uh, intro to philosophy. Oh, the, nice. The old lectures he did like <laughs> ten years ago, and I just love it because you know suddenly you're thinking in a way that you don't yeah. typically think. You, we most of us walk around and take everything for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but I, I have been a parent, and. Uh, and you know, I just I can only use the example of my my daughter uh, raising my daughter. And you know, it's that thing about you know, kids ask the funniest questions and blah blah blah. And uh, I just remember our dialogues uh, with each other, and she'd ask things. And a lot of times, you know, I'd, sometimes I'd have the answers. Sometimes I would I would encourage to look things up. Sometimes I would base it on what I thought I knew. Yeah. And my and over the years, my daughter got into a habit. Of uh, fact checking me, I love it, and bringing up uh, and and saying like, Dad, this you know, like I once had a Napoleon quote about no child has ever been, no child has ever uh, been raised correctly, uh, and she said <laughs> Napoleon didn't say that, Dad, uh, but you, you know, I, you know, my kid, did you just make that up? <laughs> I I could have sworn he did, and somebody told me he did, and I can't I can't find it. That's the problem is you can't find right, right. where it is. And uh, but then sometimes, you know, things will happen where, you know, she'll use some little tidbit I've told her in, in a class and mm -hmm. and impress the teacher and say, oh, that's my dad and this, you know, Jeopardy headset. Uh, <laughs> but she kid turned out pretty good. You know, she became an investigative reporter Amazing. Uh, and did that for a while. And I can't I can't I, I guess I like to take credit for everything. But uh, I just wonder how much credit I can take or those dialogues that we would have mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, parents, you know, what do parents do when children ask them very tough questions? Yeah. Uh, not even, I'm, I'm not even thinking about just like, you know, who was the first president or whatever it is, th those kinds of right. questions, but uh, just about, you know, tough questions in life. You know, why is this? Why is that? The, right. the philosophical, yeah. mystical uh, yeah. type of thing. So is this something that could be taught to parents for parents to use in everyday life. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's skills that you can develop in these kinds of conversations. I think that it's actually, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, when children ask empirical questions like, who's the first president? That Just look it up, right? right. <laughs> Give them the information or teach them even better. Teach them how to look it up. Um, make sure that you have a dictionary in the in the house <laughs> that they can look things up in. They're not going to get sucked into a screen. Um, but when they're asking those more philosophical questions, questions like these are the ones I get from my kids. Um, where did where did we all come from? Um, well, what happened before that? Um, how do we know what happens after you die? Um, I had a long conversation with my child who's five about um, what happens when the sun explodes, um, which is an empirical question, but also a philosophical question about like, what is our relationship to our own deaths? Um, and those are tough questions. And the, the way that I try to approach them is the first thing that I try to do is say, you know, I don't know, what do you think? You know, where I definitely have thoughts about all of these questions, but I want to know where they're coming from first. I want to know what they're starting out with first. So my child says, what happens after you die? And I say, what do you think happens after you die? They tell me, or they'll say, I don't know. And I'm just asking you. And then, you know, we can start a conversation. Well, some people think this, some people think this, what do you think about that? What do you think about this? And then you're opening, as you say, like, you know, you're entering into a dialogue where it's not just, I have the answer. Now, you know, it, unless there is an answer and you can just tell it to them. That's an expression of my values too. I'm teaching them and I'm modeling for them this process of listening, of dialogue, of looking for different perspectives, 
on an issue and trying to come up with some sort of with some sort of answer that we can both agree on. I wish I, you know, because I'm thinking about tough questions my daughter asked me, and the toughest one is, is Santa Claus real? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and let me just say, I did not do well. And, uh, oh, and, and how did you answer? And, how did you I answer? I, I don't, I can't go on the record for that one. But let's just say <laughs> I've regretted it ever since oh. and have learned the lesson. And, you know, I'll yeah. certainly speak to parents off the air. I, let's, <laughs> let's put it this way. This, my answer, what, it, what the answer should have been, or ideally would have been, is he's real if you think he is. <laughs> yeah, you know? so I, I did get that question from my child last year. Um, for my younger one, not the older one. I feel like the older one has actually like gotten the memo that as long as you <laughs> believe Santa is real, Santa brings you presents. Yeah. Um, but the younger one asked me, you know, she's she's five and she asked me, is Santa real? And I said, well, it depends on what you mean by real. So let's talk about like yep. what what's real. And so yeah. then we have a conversation. She hates, she hates it. She just wants me to tell her the answer. Well, she's you know. Like, less inclined to these kinds of conversations but um yeah we had a conversation about what counts as real and you know i think santa is real in the sense that a kind of like spirit of generosity or like magic in the world is real um it's real when we believe it and it's real when we make it um when we make that happen is there like a jolly old elf somewhere right you, know, you can just say you're getting elf. presents aren't you yeah, right. <laughs> See, this is the thing. Yeah. These are the, this is the parent now? who does what, what that kind of just says. You're getting presents, aren't you? So stop asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> you know, you I'm have that little. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You have that whiteboard on your door. Uh, you know, outside your door, you have that whiteboard, and you had that question, and the word real was mm -hmm. in there. And my response to you was going to be define real. Right. No, but that's exactly. Define reality. That's the right, that's the right the response. Where it's like, what do we mean by real? And if we mean by real something that has like, a existing right um correlate in the world that we can like see touch feel right then yeah, concrete yeah or in in some way we can like measure it then like there's lots of things that aren't real but that we still talk about and we still um and still have an outsized impact on our world um love yeah right <laughs> saying example. compassion um, which there isn't enough yeah. of trust so. justice Right, I mean, right. they're ideas, so they're abstract. Um, we're, we're in the yeah, last like quarter that. of the show, but I, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to to talk about the future of, uh, you know, philosophy for children. Is there so, any future? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> what I would like to see our pro so the philosophy program at LaGuardia is really part of this ongoing process that we have of growing is that we're trying to pivot towards a more community-based philosophical approach. So in the fieldwork, it's called public philosophy. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's like out in the public. Philosophy for children counts as public philosophy because it's engaging with the community outside of academia. And I see, especially as a community college, that one of the things that we really want to do is we're kind of at that um, we're in that sort of liminal space between right the community and like the kind of elite college system and so community college is like exactly where a community-based philosophy sort of program i think could really thrive and so we're we're pushing in that direction um through lots of outreach that we're doing um so i do the philosophy for children program shannon has been active um in philosophy in the prisons um andrew has been working with the queen's library to do these kind of public sort of outreach sort of let's go all get together and talk about philosophical questions um and of course richard with consciousness live um lots lots of us are doing these kinds of public philosophical projects and we're trying to develop more internships to be able to get our students to not only be able to access and um 
have training in this kind of approach to philosophy, but get course credit for it too, um, so that they can go and do the philosophy in the prisons, they can go and do philosophy in the Queen's Library, they can learn how to create a philosophical web series, and that's going to give them genuine academic credit, and they can then use that right as they go on and continue on either in philosophy or in the other disciplines that they choose and bring that experience um, to bear in those other fields. Um, so that's where that's where I, I see our program. It's headed. Um, you know, I, I used to run after school programs in the Bronx, a couple oh, of them. Nice. And, you know, usually you get the kids at three o'clock or, or sometime mm -hmm. like at that. You feed them, you help them with their homework, and then, you know, you try to come up with activities for them. And, yeah. you know, depending on your population, it's you struggle with uh, what people feel comfortable doing. But I could see something like this, you know, or you could train uh, the caretakers, the folks that, that take care of the, of the uh, students to have have times like this. Everybody, let's sit on the rug and talk about and it, it would be an amazing if, if it can't be put into the curriculum of the regular school day mm -hmm. it would be something fascinating as after school is that something you'd be interested in too yeah absolutely and that's what that's what i'm doing this semester with philosophy and puppets it's an after school enrichment um that you know it's just me so you know i'm i, I can't be everywhere all at once but would right. be incredible to be able to connect with other educators who are interested in in similar sorts of ideas to be able to create something that has a larger um, footprint, more so, inter. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever come up with a Socrates puppet and tried to uh, there are, some little character there that walks are around? Socrates puppets <laughs> out there, but so I, um, my bit from last week was a kind of Socrates puppet, though I called him Pierre for obvious reasons. Um, but he had googly eyes and he had question marks all over himself and a little white tuft of fluff right at the top. So <laughs> very good. And a shabby little robe. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't have a robe because he's a rock. <laughs> so, so, he did, so he didn't he need it. Toga. So we have a little bit of time uh, before we go out. So anything else you'd like to talk about? We have. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, one thing that I'd love to talk about before we um, before we break is um, the student parent uh, initiative on our campus. So this is an organization that I'm part of um, that emerged from my work and Cone Am's work. Um, she's in psychology um, with the early childhood learning center. And in the Early Childhood Learning Center, they do a lot of outreach with our student parents. It's primarily student parents whose children are in the Early Childhood Learning Center. And when Kuhn and I both had our, our children were very young, we were kind of had this first person view of the ways in which LaGuardia was in some ways like very child friendly and in some ways could really improve its child friendliness. And so um, this is really Cone's baby creating the student parent initiative at LaGuardia, where it's a group of faculty from across many disciplines um, who've come together to try to create a much more uh, welcoming and supportive space for student parents. And we've tried to do that by um, creating a more child friendly experience at LaGuardia. So we advocated for the of um, nursing stations on campus. So you may have seen there's actually nursing stations on campus. It used to not be the case. We're working now on trying to get those um, changing tables in all of the restrooms, not just in the women's restrooms, <laughs> um, so that you know our our student parents who are men can also bring their children and. Uh, change them. We have sort of semi-monthly power hours in which we invite student parents and really anybody who's interested to share stories and learn about resources on campus. And we are doing a clothing drive that's going to be coming up really soon for children's clothing specific children's boutique pop-up um, that will, you know, give away clothes, 
we'll create a cool space where people who have children can come together and talk um, and be in community. Um, and yeah, so that's what we're doing. These are these are our initiatives, and it's um, we advocated. I think one one of the ways that we were really active on campus was in pushing for that um, children on campus policy for students and for faculty and staff, and making that to be as open as we possibly could have it. Um, and I think we were really, really successful um, with that because as it started, they did not want to allow children on campus at all. And now children are allowed on campus, but they do have to be supervised, so, um, which makes sense. So that's the work that we're doing. If people out there want to be involved in, you know, making the campus more child friendly, there are a couple of things that you can do. Um, one of the things you can do is actually put language on your syllabus that talks about what your individual policy is about children in the classroom. It is typically the case that students do not want to bring their children to campus, right? They're here to learn. It's a kind of escape sometimes from the difficulties and challenges of your everyday life. You get to come and have this, this space. It's also the case that sometimes life intervenes and is it better for them to stay home with their child if they have to, or is it better for them to bring the child to class? Having something on your syllabus that says that is, I think, really helpful, um, what your specific policy is. Another thing we can do is when we're hosting events on campus, which all of us do, right? We're hosting events on campus all the time, asking ourselves, are these events kid-friendly? And if they are, saying that. I know they do this at the uh, at the astronomy events where they say, bring your families, right? Bring kids, like it's cool. Like this can be a cool community event. I think that I would love to see all of the events on campus saying explicitly if they're kid friendly, that kids are invited. Um, if they're not, that's okay, right? Not everything has to be has to be for kids. But if it is, I think it goes a long way to making that space um, in which Children are welcome, children are encouraged. They are not our, our current students, but they're future students. And um, speaking of psychology, I love Alison Gopnik. She's a child psychologist. Alison Gopnik has this wonderful metaphor of the relationship between the ways in which children think and the ways in which adults think. Children are the kind of like research and development department of humanity, right? They're the ones with all the creativity, all the imagination, they're the ones, they're research and development. And then adults are more like the, are more like the production and marketing department, right? And what would production and marketing be without research and development? What would research and development be without production and marketing, right? There's so many ways in which that partnership and that collaboration can be really powerful. And I think that as a community college, especially we're in the perfect position to try to make that happen. Wise words, <laughs> wise words. Uh, so the show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez. And today my guest has been Dr. Sherry Carr, who is the coordinator of the philosophy program here in the Humanities Department of the Division of Academic Affairs. And uh, Dr. Carr has been discussing her work in the area of philosophy for children. And uh, I think also in, you know, again, the importance of children. You know, I, I came to New York at a time when New York was not kid friendly. I come from a community in South Florida that where I was surrounded by children. Mm -hmm. And all it did, my, what made me want to do is have a kid. <laughs> and then once I had that, once I had that child, you know, uh, again, experiencing how the, how how New York was not ready for children mm -hmm. yet. It's become it's become better. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more work to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I support I support you in, in, in all those endeavors. And uh, again, thanks, everybody, for watching, for listening. And uh, our engineer, Mr. Pope. Please take us out as we came in. Thanks. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Sherry.